Welcome to Enter the Unknown. My name is FJ and we're back today for the final episode of our Pokemon Platinum Random Card Challenge series. After finishing off Team Galactic, earning our 8th Sinnoh Gym Badge and defeating Barry in the last episode, we're finally ready for the Elite Four. As always, we're going to be drawing teams from my Pokemon card collection and using them to take on our opponents in set battles where we've matched levels exactly and no items are allowed. Anyway, all of the Elite Four members will require a team of five, and Aaron's up first. Against the Bug-type Specialist, we'll be using Swallow, Bronzong, Shelder, Sudowoodo, and Piplup. That's a really strong team, although a Fire-type would have been nice. I think Aaron's covered his weaknesses reasonably well, so this could still be tough. Let's have a look at what moves we'll have on hand for the first Elite Four battle. At level 49, Landreval the Swellow's got the moves Quick Attack, Double Team, Endeavor, and Aerial Ace. I'd ideally like some more powerful attacks, but this should work well enough. Yongle the Bronzong's also at 49, and Extra Sensory, Iron Defense, Hypnosis, and Confuse Ray make up its moveset. Bronzong is mostly there to stop Aaron from getting into any sort of rhythm. Kohog the Shelter's up at level 51, and his moveset's made up of Explosion, Protect, Ice Shard, and Clamp. You know I've started to lose it when I'm just throwing Explosion in first. Usually that's a 4th slot kind of move, you know? I know it doesn't make any difference, but it just feels like a 4th slot kind of move. Not today. Our level 50 is Lamina the Sudowoodo, and she's equipped with Rock Slide, Sucker Punch, Double Edge, and Faint Attack. As long as she's feeling accurate, that should work well enough. Finally, we've got Dawn the Piplup at level 53, and she has Waterfall, Mist, Bide, and Drill Peck. As I'm sure you've worked out, this is kind of like that episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! where Yugi battles Bakura and everyone's soul gets trapped in their favourite card. Dawn's soul is in fact trapped inside Piplup, and she'll only be freed if we win. If we lose, she will be sent to the Shadow Realm. I think that was the consequence for losing. So, pretty low stakes. Let's, uh, let's get into it. Our Elite Four run begins with Aaron's Yanmega facing off against our Piplup. We call for a Drill Peck to start, but Dawn can't get moving quickly enough and she's struck by Yanmega's U-turn. It hurts, but Aaron's switch in eases our pain. Heracross replaces Yanmega, so when Drill Peck makes contact, it's hitting a quad-weak Pokémon. That means we get to start the battle off with a one-shot, so thank you, Aaron. Vespaquen's up next, which is also a pretty friendly switch for Dawn. Almost immediately, Piplup has Vespaquen on the defensive as she peppers the Queen Bee with Drill Peck after Drill Peck. Defend Order and Heal Order leave the room looking like some sort of Nick Cage pagan nightmare, but they do a workable job of keeping Vespaquen healthy. Something's gotta give, though, and I'm not referencing an early 2000s movie this time. Eventually, Piplup lands a critical hit on Drill Peck and that ignores Vespaquen's defense boost to earn us another knockout. Dawn's kinda killing it here. I guess avoiding spending eternity in the Shadow Realm is a pretty good motivator. I'll keep that in mind. Aaron sends out Scizor next, and this could be a problem. Piplup shows no fear striking the Steely Bug with yet another Drill Peck, but his shiny exterior is almost impenetrable. Aaron calls for an X Scissor, which Scizor executes, sending Dawn crashing backwards across the battlefield. Against all odds, she actually survives the hit. As hard as Piplup tries though, she cannot reach Scizor in time to use Drill Peck as a quick attack takes her down for good. So? Bad news, Dawn has been sent to the Shadow Realm. Good news, I think she'll be freed if we win. Maybe. We might need to destroy a Millennium Item or something, I really can't remember. Anyway, back to the battle. We call on Bronzong next and go for a Confuse Ray, hoping that will slow Scizor down. While Aaron continues to shout out X-Scissor, Yongle misses with Hypnosis, but just before being hit by a finishing blow, succeeds in putting Scizor to sleep. We make a switch out to Shelder, because Extra Sensory won't be worth much here. Kohog enters the battle and starts by clamping down on the sleeping Scizor. Now, I know this may seem weird against a sleeping Pokémon, but next up we call for Explosion. I have my reasons, they will become apparent in a short while. The attack leaves Aaron's room destroyed and the battlefield empty, so Swellow and Yanmega replace the fainted Pokémon. Landreval starts with a double team and Yanmega does too, which won't really play here. Swallow's Aerial Ace is never going to miss, and when it sends Yanmega crashing into the wall, Aaron's probably wishing he attacked. I'm honestly not sure if we needed the critical hit, but I'm not going to complain. Aaron sends out his final Pokémon, Drapion, and wanting to end things quickly, Swallow strikes with Aerial Ace. Drapion stands up to it much better, countering with a powerful Ice Fang that freezes Landreval. Rather comically, Drapion somehow manages to miss the bird-shaped block of ice with a Cross Poison and an Ice Fang. Swellow can't take advantage though, and third time lucky, Drapion bites down with Ice Fang for the knockout. We send Yongle back in next, and after tanking an X-Scissor, it connects with a Confuse Ray. 
Drapion hits himself in confusion, but another miss on Hypnosis leaves it unpunished. Drapion strikes Bronzong with an X scissor, taking us into one on one, and now I'm nervous. We send out Sudowoodo, and as I'm pretty sure Drapion only has attacks, we call for a Sucker Punch. Lamina takes Drapion below half health before he strikes with the only move that Aaron apparently knows. After another hit, Lamina throws herself into Drapion with a double edge, which almost scores the knockout, and thankfully, Drapion's holding a Citrus Berry. That's all that prevents Aaron from using a full restore. After one more X scissor, Lamina knocks Drapion off his feet with a thunderous double edge to earn us the win and potentially free Dawn from the Shadow Realm. I'm still not sure about that one. The reason for that premature explosion earlier was that what you just watched was like attempt 30 or something. Aaron just kept destroying me. Whenever he healed up Scissor or Drapion, we just had no chance. So yeah, shout out to a few clutch crits and some bad moves from Aaron there. That was really tough. All right, Birth is up next, and we're going to be using Electrike, Trap Inch, Mr. Mime, Magikarp, and Tangela. That's an interesting draw. The typings are pretty balanced for a battle against a ground type specialist, although I'm not sure Magikarp will offer as much as you'd expect of a water type. This will be another tough one. Let's have a look at our movesets. Up first, we've got Flop the Magikarp, who's level 52 with the moves Tackle, Splash, and Flail. Powerful stuff. Chomp the Trap Inch is a level higher at 53, and he's equipped with Dig, Sand Attack, Sunny Day, and Crunch. Herschel the Mr. Mime is back at level 52, and he's got Psychic, Reflect, Substitute, and Magical Leaf. At level 50, Volt the Electrike has Quick Attack, Roar, Bite, and Return. It was a bit weird to set up an Electric type like this, but otherwise he'd be a bit useless against Bertha's ground types. Finally, at level 55, we've got Boots the Tangler, and his moveset's made up of Mega Drain, Sunny Day, Sleep Powder, and Solar Beam. We've got a real mixed bag here. Let's see what they can do. Our second Elite Four challenge begins with Flop the Magikarp taking on Bertha's Whiskash. Cutting through the water at incredible speed, Magikarp reaches Whiskash before she's ready to attack. Flop slams into her side and basically just bounces right off. While Magikarp's recovering from his... attack? Whiskash's earth power sends him crashing into the ceiling above, and by the time he splashes down, Bertha has the lead. Magikarp returns and we send in Mr. Mime, who's learned everything possible from Flop's vital scouting mission. Herschel gets things going with a magical leaf that completely overpowers Whiskash, leveling up the match. Bertha calls on her Apowdon next, and as soon as she enters the battle, a sandstorm begins. The sand slightly shreds up Mr. Mime's magical leaf, but the bulk of the barrage still makes contact, badly injuring her Apowdon. She then moves through the sand, avoiding Herschel's line of sight, and crunches down on him once she's close. Despite almost being swallowed whole, Mr. Mime lives to fight another day. Another magical leaf cuts through the sandstorm, but Bertha heals Hippowdon just before the attack lands. Not wanting to be completely devoured by a Hippowdon though, Herschel puts his all into this one, scoring a critical hit to hand us the lead. Then, for reasons known only to her, Bertha sends out her Rhyperior, who's slow and quad weak to the only move she knows Mr. Mime can use. With only 6 hit points remaining, Herschel sends another magical leaf flying towards Bertha's selected Pokemon. Rhyperior is knocked out in one, but the Raging Sandstorm finishes off Mr. Mime, so I guess we'll call that one a draw? We call on Volt next, hoping for Gliscor, and Bertha doesn't disappoint. As fast as Volt is though, he can't outrun Gliscor's Earthquake, so it didn't really matter who she used. I feel like there might have been need for a fast Pokemon who isn't weak to grass earlier, but I can't remember. Anyway, we go out to Trap Inch next, because he's got an important job to do. We call for Sunny Day as Bertha instructs Gliscor to attack with Earthquake again. The attack lands, but it's not enough to take down Chomp, who replaces the Sandstorm with a Sunny Day. Gliscor barely notices though, as he speeds in and bites down on Chomp with an Ice Fang. That leaves us in a 1 on 2, but we've been saving our best for last. That Trap Inch Sunny Day was put in place to allow Boots to freely use Solar Beam, so that's exactly how we get started. An incredibly timely critical hit one-shots Gliscor, which prevents her from using a super effective Ice Fang, so that could be a game changer. Well, actually, it, it will be, because Golem's up last and there's no way in hell she's surviving a Solar Beam. Boots annihilates Golem in one, so we've beaten Bertha. I really think that critical hit against Gliscor made all the difference. Anyway, that's two down, so let's find out our team to face Flint. For our third Elite Four face-off, we'll be using the team of Growlithe, Mankey, Regice, Arcanine, and Tentacruel. That's a really powerful team for this series, even if it isn't exactly ideally suited to take on Flint. It's probably the worst possible time to draw Regice, but it'll probably still be solid. Let's see if our movesets are looking good. 
Up first we've got Saki the Mankey who's at level 55 with the moves Cross Chop, Swagger, Assurance and Close Combat. Chester the Growlithe's at level 52 and he's got Crunch, Agility, Takedown and Reversal. Berg the Regice is at 53 and its moveset features Ancient Power, Curse, Amnesia and Hyper Beam. At level 55, Maker the Arcanine's equipped with Extreme Speed, Roar, Crunch and Thunderfang. Finally, our ace at level 57, Marky the Tentacruel, has the moves Surf, Supersonic, Toxic Spikes, and Hydro Pump. I'm feeling pretty good about this one. Let's get into it. Flint sends out his Houndoom to start the battle, and we get things going with Mankey. Saki runs towards the Demon Dog, but when he swings with a cross chop, Houndoom quickly dodges it. Flint calls for a sunny day, which may be a problem, but Mankey chases Houndoom down and lands a cross chop on his back. That attack slams Houndoom into the dirt, and he never gets back up. Flint makes the change out to Rapidash, and at this point, there's no real reason for us to make a switch. Saki's Cross Chop forces another Pokemon back, but Rapidash lives the hit and leaps into the air. We know a bounce is incoming, but we just have to accept our fate. Rapidash plummets to Earth, landing on top of Saki, knocking him out to tie things up. We call on Arcanine next, and on the off chance Flint doesn't use a healing item, we go for extreme speed. A full restore does come, but a couple of strikes from Maker leave Rapidash back on the cusp of fainting. Flint calls for a sunny day as Arcanine cuts through Rapidash to give us back the advantage. Infernape comes in next and he's immediately struck by extreme speed. This time, now that Flint's done his homework, he has a counter in mind. Infernape's earthquake rocks the entire building and from full health it wipes out Arcanine thanks to a critical hit. We go out to Growlithe so that we can get off an attack drop on Infernape and then call for takedown. Intimidate stops Earthquake from one-shotting Chester but Infernape dodges his takedown so it doesn't really matter. Mock Punch lands on the back of Growlithe's head to give Flint the lead, but we've outlasted Sunny Day. That means it's time for Tentacruel, whose water type moves are no longer weakened. Marky instantly sends a powerful wave crashing into Infernape that washes him away, leaving us in a 2 on 2. When Magmortar enters, we recall Tentacruel and send out Regice, whose massive special defense stat is better suited for this one. Thunderbolt barely leaves a mark on Berg, who watches on as Flint calls for. Solar Beam? Magmortar has Flamethrower, so I'm really not sure what's going on there. Ancient Power slowly chips down Magmortar's HP as Flint calls for Solar Beam over and over again. Eventually, Regice knocks out Magmortar, but that was really bizarre. I feel like I must be missing something because that made no sense. Perhaps Flint learned from his mistakes because when Flareon enters the battle, he calls for Overheat. That's too much for Berg, but it did exactly what we required. Marky returns to battle and is hit by a quick attack, but he hardly even notices. Surf blows away Flareon, and just like that, we've made it to the final Elite Four member. All of the first three took us into a one-on-one, -on -one, though, so this has not been easy. Let's see if our team for Lucian can make things any simpler. Against the Psychic Specialist, we'll be using the team of Horsey, Jolteon, Raichu, Weavile, and Krabby. I think Weavile may be one of the best individual draws we've ever had. The rest of the team's really solid, too. I'm actually feeling good about this one. Let's see if the movesets do anything to change that. Claw the Weavile's at level 56, and he's got Night Slash, Screech, Metal Claw, and Faint Attack. At 53, Campos the Horsey has Surf, Dragon Dance, Dragon Pulse, and Hydro Pump. Surge the Raichu's at level 54, and she's equipped with Thunderbolt, Tail Whip, Signal Beam, and Thunder. Our level 55 is Spike the Jolteon, and his movesets made up of Thunderbolt, Sand Attack, Shadow Ball, and Thunder. Lastly, we've got Malico the Krabby, who's at 59, with Crab Hammer, Protect, Slam, and Guillotine. Oko moves are a bit like Metronome for me, I can't not use them when they're an option. Alright, let's give this a go. Lucian leads off with his Mr. Mime, and we start out with Weavile. In seconds, Claw closes the distance and slices Mr. Mime with a Night Slash, which just obliterates the Feeble Psychic type. When Lucian sends out his Glade, we call for Night Slash once more, and with Claw in close, it lands immediately. A critical hit wipes out Lucian's ace, so that's a pretty good star. Lucian returns Glade to its Pokeball and switches in Bronzong. We're also about ready for a change, so make the swap out to Raichu. Clearly that pays off as a Gyro Ball aimed for Weavile hits Surge instead. It's not very effective, so we don't need to worry, but Signal Beam doesn't do much either. I really should have just gone for Thunderbolt there, but sometimes I need to make bad moves to lull opponents into a false sense of security. It's all part of the plan. Anyway, while I was rambling, an earthquake opened up a hole in the ground that swallowed Raichu, so it's probably best to just move on. We send out Horsey and call for Hydro Pump, which he sprays right at the wall before being thrown into the pit by Psychic. Somebody really needs to repair this hole, it's becoming problematic. 
Anyway, with Campos down, we send in Krabby, and you know what's coming here. We call for Guillotine, but sadly, Bronzong slowly floats out of the way before sending Malako in a distinctly pitward direction. That leaves us with only two, and I don't really want Claw to have to take a Gyro Ball, so we send in Jolteon. Spike sends a Shadow Ball careening into Bronzong, and the gong sounds out around the room. It's a critical hit, but it still comes up just short. Lucian's not on the hook for repair costs though, so calls for Earthquake once more, but Jolteon's not so easily defeated. Unfortunately, right before a second Shadow Ball connects, Lucian uses a full restore to extend this awful, awful face-off. We do get a special defense drop, which means another Shadow Ball takes Bronzong back into red health, but Psychic casts Spike aside. So that makes it 4 for 4 on Elite members taking us down to 1. Weavile returns to battle and almost instantly slices deep into Bronzong, for whom the bell tolls. That takes Lucian down to 2, and from here, we should be in the clear. Before he can even muster up some spoon-based offense, Alakazam is knocked out by Claw's Night Slash. Espeon's outlast for Lucian, but if you can't stop Weavile with a heart full of dreams and a handful of spoons, then a cat with a slingshot tail's got no chance in this crazy world. Night Slash cuts short Espeon's appearance, and with that, we've defeated the Elite Four. Every single member took us down to one, with Aaron and Lucian even picking up wins. One for Lucian, and about 4,000 for Aaron. We've made it through all the same, though. Now, only the champion remains. For only the second time in the series, we'll need a full team of six, which just seems weird. Why does nobody in Pokemon games have a full party? Anyway, our final team of the series will be... Fione, Marowak, Drifloon, Butterfree, Eevee, and Slowpoke. Okay... Usually I'd be pretty psyched for that team, but at 480, Fione has our highest base stat total by a good distance, and that's lower than Cynthia's worst Pokemon, so this will be incredibly tough. Our average base stat total is just south of 380, and Cynthia's is at 533. And a third. When you add in the fact that she'll be using items here and we won't, I'm not overly confident. Let's see if the movesets can help that at all. Up first, we've got Bye Bye the Butterfree, who's at level 60 with the moves Bug Buzz, Sleep Powder, Tailwind, and Psybeam. Compound Eyes as an ability makes that Sleep Powder incredibly useful. Karo the Marowak's up next, two levels lower at 58, and he's equipped with Earthquake, Endeavor, Double Edge, and Bone Rush. Nana the Drifloon's also at 58, and she's got Shadow Ball, Minimize, Toxic, and Shockwave. Jewel the Fiona's our third 58, and has the moves Surf, Charm, Rain Dance, and Ice Beam. Envy the Eevees at level 60, and okay, I just wanted to try something here. Her only moves are Return and Last Resort. Envy is an Eevee whose sole purpose is to hit like a truck. Last up, we've got Dash the Slowpoke, our ace at level 62, and his moveset's made up of Blizzard, Yawn, Psychic, and Surf. Okay, let's see what this team can do. Cynthia sends out her Spiritomb to start the battle, and we lead off with Butterfree. We call for a Sleep Powder to start, and thanks to Compound Eyes, we don't really have to worry about a miss. The 1.3 times accuracy boost means it's now got an accuracy of 97.5%, so any miss will be incredibly unfortunate. While Spiritomb is sleeping, Bye Bye is able to attack with a double helping of Bug Buzz, and just like that, we've got the first win of the match. Very, very good start. Cynthia's second Pokemon is Togekiss, but we've already got a rhythm going and call for Sleep Powder once more. Naturally, it connects, and with that, we make our first switch out to Drifloon. Nana attacks Togekiss repeatedly with Shockwave until she finally awakens and counters with a Shockwave. Okay. Drifloon lives through the hit, but a full restore from Cynthia means a fourth Nana Shockwave isn't good for a knockout. She does at least manage to shock Togekiss once more before a Water Pulse takes her down. That still went well, though, and we burned through a full restore, so I'm not complaining. We go back out to Butterfree next because Togekiss is awake, and honestly, that's kind of inconvenient. Sleep Powder remedies that, and thankfully it's a good dose because it takes Bye Bye three turns to finish off the weakened flyer. Alright, that's 2-1 for Team Butterfree, so Cynthia calls on her Milotic next. Obviously, we start with a Sleep Powder, and then make the switch out to Eevee. Time to put her power to the test. Envy charges into Milotic, sending her crashing into the wall, which, while effective, also wakes her up, which is not ideal. Thankfully, Cynthia wasn't expecting our adorable Eevee to be a beastly physical attacker and called for Mirror Coat, so no problems here. Last Resort, which is really just second resort in this case, is Envy's next attack, and as it deals even more damage than Return, it's more than Milotic can take. Cynthia returns the crumpled heap of C... Cock? No. No, 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 no. No, stop. I was trying to mix C and Peacock, and that's just not the way to do it. She recalls Milotic, and sends out Lucario, and we take a risk calling for another attack. 
Eevee begins her charge, but an Aura Spear throws her backwards and Lucario's power combined with a super effective move are simply too much. Envy faints, so we're forced to recall her and send in Marowak. We call for Earthquake, and as Karo gets set to attack, he's blasted by another Aura Sphere. Unlike Eevee though, Marowak knows how to take a hit. Brushing off the Aura Sphere, he uses Earthquake, and the power of the move overwhelms Lucario, who's knocked out, leaving Cynthia with only two. Rosary's out next, and again, this is really about accepting our fate. We could switch out to Butterfree, who'd happily take a grass hit, but I can't risk Cynthia calling for another attack because Karo is weak. In the end, it is just an energy ball, but we need to play this smart. Marowak has done his job. We send Bye Bye back into battle with our free switch, and in a move that will truly shock everyone watching, we call for Sleep Powder. Once Roserade is sound asleep, we switch out to Slowpoke, but Cynthia also makes a change, bringing out Garchomp. We call for Blizzard, but Garchomp strikes with Dragon Rush before Dash even registers that he's out of his Pokeball. After being thrown across the battlefield, Slowpoke realizes where he is and summons a Blizzard that engulfs Garchomp. With almost no health remaining, Garchomp uses her wings to blow the Blizzard away and then devours a Citrus Berry to recover some HP. Dash begins to use Blizzard once again as Garchomp speeds towards him but misses with Dragon Rush. Sadly, Slowpoke's Blizzard was aimed where Garchomp was when he started, so it misses too. Rather spectacularly, I might add. I mean, Cynthia's probably a bit cold. Spinning around, Garchomp strikes Dash on the way back past, which renders him unable to battle. Now we're into a 2 on 2. Fiona enters for the first time, and with Garchomp weak from her face off with Slowpoke, a single Ice Beam scores Jewel the knockout. Roserade returns to battle, and thanks to Natural Cure, she's woken up. Fiona attacks with Ice Beam once again, and although it badly injures Roserade, she's got just enough left in the tank to send an Energy Ball barreling into Jewel. Cynthia's Pokemon are incredibly well trained, and the hit is just too much for Fiona to take. So, for the fifth consecutive battle, we're down to one. Butterfree glides back into action and, just to be safe, starts out with Sleep Powder. Of course, it makes contact and with Roserade sleeping, Bye Bye just has to attack with Psybeam to finish the match. We have defeated Cynthia and officially beaten the game using teams drawn from my Pokemon card collection. That performance from Butterfree has to go down as one of the all-time greats. We could have had a much stronger Pokemon in that slot and not have stood a chance. Anyway, that will do it for the Sinnoh Random Card Challenge. I'm not sure what the future of this series is right now. With the effort it takes to make and the diminishing popularity, it's essentially costing me money to produce at this point, but I do really enjoy making them. Those of you who watch also seem to like it, so I definitely don't want to stop. I think what I'll possibly do is just work on the next series in my spare time and try to get everything done before I start uploading it. I'm really not sure right now. Any suggestions are very much appreciated. If you have stuck around till now and enjoyed this series, then seriously, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.